Good morning, everybody. My name's Randy. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to those of you watching online. And welcome to Palm Sunday. You wonder if I am a week late on St. Patrick's Day. I'm dressed up as a palm. And I was waving during the service. And the, the whole staff is wondering when I will be done with the stupid jokes. So, oh, don't encourage me like that. <laughs> Guys, welcome to Easter. It's just going to be such a good time. Uh, this week, then Friday night at 6, and, and then Sunday morning. I hope you'll come and join us for breakfast. This whole mini-series that we're interrupting our series on Ephesians for is called Him For Me. And it's based on perhaps the most amazing, amazing chapter in the Old Testament, in my opinion. I wonder if you knew this. There are over 300, 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. The chances of one person fulfilling that many prophecies is so astronomical, it's it's a bigger number than, than I can count. They're crazy. And they're all sorts of snapshots. And they kind of they give us a little bit of a, a picture of Jesus on the cross. And they give us a picture of Jesus the week before. Did you know that it was prophesied in the Old Testament that Jesus would come into Jerusalem on a donkey colt? Did you know that he would be crucified, and that is spoken of in the Old Testament before crucifixion was an act of execution. Did you know that it was prophesied that he would be given wine to drink along with gall? Did you know that he would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There are so many little prophecies, but they're all little snapshots, and they don't give us a clear picture. But I would like today... It says, look at the passage that gives us an ultra HD, high definition view of Jesus as he hangs on the cross and is resurrected. I mean, this is so clear. It's so clear that it's, it's, uh, it's offended Jews to this day. I don't know if you knew that. This passage is toward the end of what scholars call the servant discourse which is Isaiah 40 to 54, and we're going to look at chapter 53 today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it basically to the middle and just a little past the middle and uh, go to Isaiah 53. The servant discourse really defines the people of Israel as a servant, but it's, it's like, I don't know if you've ever been on a, on a bike, and, and when you shift that rear derailleur up to another gear, it, it feels like power kept in. And, uh, and, and so while it's talking about the people of Israel, it shifts into a discussion of the Messiah in chapter 53. And it's so cool. This is also called the forbidden chapter. The forbidden chapter, and, is, and the people call it, or the Israelis call it that, because most Jews refuse to read it because it looks too much like Jesus of Nazareth. So let's jump in. Verse 1 of Isaiah 53 says, Who has believed our message? And that is a rhetorical question, meaning nobody believes it. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now this beginning verse tells us immediately that few will believe what's about to be said. I wonder if you came to church today and you're kind of wondering, do I believe this stuff or do I not? Am, am I in? Am I in all the way? What's interesting is that like I said, the first few chapters of the servant discourse are about the people of Israel. Most of the nations did not believe 
that Israel worshiped a good God. Then most of Israel did not believe that Jesus was their Messiah. It's, it's interesting. There's just all sorts of unbelief here. And I think Isaiah wants you to feel welcome in your unbelief. Like, if you're like this guy and you're struggling, do I believe this or not? Isaiah somehow paints a picture 700 years before Jesus. Now, if my math is right, that would be someone in the 1400s telling about something that would happen in our century. Is that correct? Bill, help me out with that. Is that right? Okay, Bill. Bill's getting his doctorate, so I know I can trust him. Okay. Um, so, could you imagine someone writing something about something happening in the 1400s that would happen in the 21st century? So, this is just crazy. So, it's, it goes on to say this, for he, meaning the Messiah, grew up before him, before God the Father, like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Now, this is written in poetic language, and I chose a little bit more of a, a literal translation because it catches the poetic language what is it saying here? The poetic metaphor here is of a tiny shoot growing up in the middle of a desert. Now, how many of you are just, well, first of all, I would be impressed seeing that because, wow, there's actually something trying to make its way out here. But it's not real impressive. It's saying that when God is incarnated in his son, he will not be real impressive. Now, I've, I've been in the church all my life, and I've had a lot of men say, oh, this Jesus, he was a man's man. He probably had huge biceps. I bet his thighs were massive because he walked everywhere. Yeah. All right. And I, I just want to tell you that Isaiah describes him as absolutely nobody special. If you were walking through the airport and Jesus walked by, you would not even go, oh, now that's the Messiah. You'd go, I didn't even see him. He's, he's the face of every man. He's the face of no man. He's just a nobody. Contrast to that, if he would have been called a majestic oak tree. Oh, no. And everybody that sees him would say, now that is for sure the Messiah. But he wasn't. He was a little tiny little thing springing out of the desert. I don't know if you knew this, guys, but many of the leaders in history were acclaimed as being something really good to look at. King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody around him, super tall and stinking handsome. Like everybody that looked at him went, man, that guy, that guy is the king. That, whoa. Like this guy, he was the first king of Israel, and everybody just said, man, he is made to be a king. He's so doggone good looking. The way Samuel describes King David is that David was ruddy, like he, he kind of had reddish skin and had this wavy, good-looking hair, and he was just a handsome dude. I mean stinking handsome. Just really a handsome guy. I don't know if you knew this, but Alexander the Great was known as a really handsome guy. I didn't realize this. Like Napoleon, he was just over five foot tall. A little tiny guy. 
kept his hand in his toga like this. No, I don't, I don't know if that's true. He reportedly was stocky, muscular, with a prominent forehead and ruddy complexion, and was said to be extremely handsome, with a certain melting look in his eye. He'd just look at you and you'd melt. Most accounts give him curly, shoulder-length blonde hair and fair skin. And according to Plutarch, he had a ruddy tinge to his skin, especially on his face and chest. He was apparently unable to grow a beard. And so during Alexander's day, it became cool to not have a beard because that's the way he went around. Henry VIII was known to be extremely handsome in his younger days, over six foot tall and had a, just an incredibly athletic build. Don't know if you knew that Joseph Stalin, when he was younger, was claimed to be extremely handsome with his long, dark hair and his mustache. And then, of course, in American history, a lot of us think of John F. Kennedy, just a, wow, just a, I mean, man, I, I'm a guy, and I don't know when guys are handsome, but when I look at John F. Kennedy, I go, well, he, he kind of looks handsome. Um, and then he, he marries Jacqueline Onassis, and the two of them together were just, I mean, just eye-popping, and it's known as the era of Camelot because they were so good-looking together. And um, man, it's just, it's crazy. But again, notice this about Jesus. He has no stately form or majesty that we... Go ahead and go to the next slide. Can we get there? He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He's just a plain old guy. I don't know if you know that, but that's who he was. Now, I just want to point something out to you. According to Isaiah, Jesus was despised. He was forsaken, full of sorrow, acquainted with grief and sickness, and was not esteemed. I wonder if you can relate to that at all. I mean, Jesus is a picture of every man and every woman. The God of the universe put into an earth suit a human body, looks like nothing special, and he gets despised, forsaken, he's full of sorrow, acquainted with grief and sickness, not esteemed. How many of those can you check off for yourself? I have people all the time saying, I can't believe in a God who would allow so much wickedness and evil and so much pain on this earth. And the picture God wants you and me to see is a picture of his son walking this earth, bearing that pain with us. He is not untouched by what we go through. I want you to hear that. God loves me and loves you so dearly that he took on himself our rejection, our pain. You say, Randy, I don't really relate to that. I was in the popular crowd when I was in high school. Probably one out of all of you here was one of those people. Even people who seem to have it all together um, don't always have it together. Have you noticed that? Now, I'm, I'm not recommending this movie, but Leo DiCaprio in the movie Once Upon a Time in Hollywood plays an aging actor, and he's got a new part as a bad guy in a movie, and the first day of the shooting, he, um, he's, he has a hangover because he got drunk the night before, and he can't remember his lines, and it shows him go back to his, go back to his little cabin, 
and he was throwing things and just yelling at himself. You're such a pitiful actor. You're pitiful. You can't even remember your dumb lines. And he's just yelling at himself. Oh, I hate you. You're pitiful. You're just pitiful. Can anybody relate to that? Okay, nobody raised their hand. Anyway, I have mine up. So the very next day, he's in another, another scene, and you're watching this scene, and, and you realize what an actor DiCaprio is because he just, he just does it so good. And, and this little girl that was in the scene with him says, you're the best actor I've ever seen. And all these people come up and say, I'm so glad you did this. That was so amazing. And after everybody walks off, he looks at himself and goes, yeah, still got it. And I laughed because I thought, this is the life of somebody who is trying to be established and loved by their performance. And we all fail. We all fail. And Jesus came and entered into that failure with us. He entered into that rejection with us. Isn't that just incredible? That's why it's him for me. He came for me. He came for me. He came for you. He took upon himself what you have gotten all your life to what he got. It says he was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Acquainted. He and grief are buddies. Did you catch that? How many of you are in grief today? You don't need to raise your hand. Did you know Jesus was good buddies with grief? And like one for men who, mm, let's try that again. And like one for men hide their faces, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. Have you ever seen somebody that you just couldn't even look at because you couldn't even esteem him that much? That's Jesus. Jesus took on flesh for me. He took on flesh for me, for you, to be despised, forsaken, and he completely relates to the sorrow and well acquainted with our griefs. Man, I love that. That word griefs, interesting in the Hebrew. It could mean griefs. It could also mean sicknesses, maladies, fears, phobias, demons, anxieties. Does anybody here deal with any of those? Surely, surely he bore those things. I love that. I, I just love that. He took on himself my sickness. He took on himself my grief. Let's talk about spiritual, physical, mental, emotional maladies. Jesus took on himself. That word covers it all. You say, Randy, I don't agree with you. It's primarily talking about a spiritual issue. I will prove you wrong in a minute, okay? Sorrow. That word sorrow could mean sorrows, but it could also mean pains. I wonder if you are heavy laden today with lots of sorrow. If you're in pain, physical pain, I wonder if you're in emotional pain. I wonder if you wonder if you'll ever get out of the prison you feel like you're in. Jesus took it upon himself so that you could be free from that. 
he whom the Son of God sets free is free indeed, said Jesus. Now look what it says then. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. There is a direct word relating to crucifixion. And it speaks it in the past tense, but it's all about the future. He was pierced through for our transgressions. We thought he had done evil, and that was why he was hung on that cross. But Isaiah wants us to make sure that we understand he was pierced through for my sin. He was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being, the disciplining for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, we are healed. Friend, can you get this into your heart? Can you get this into your heart? I was in seminary when this became real to me. I was in upper level Greek class, and we we're studying the book of Luke when Jesus said the only Aramaic in the New Testament, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated right from Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And my professor, who was dry and old and very smart, but not really a great orator, began to talk about how Jesus took on himself our sin to the point that Jesus, for the first time in eternity past and eternity future, felt separated from his dad for me. And somehow the Holy Spirit opened the curtain for me and he helped me grasp that he did that for Randy Craney. And I began to weep uncontrollably in the middle of upper level Greek class in a dumb seminary. I remember walking out of there because it was right toward the end of the class and I could not stop weeping. I couldn't talk, stop and talk to any of my friends. I had to walk out to my car and just sit there and thank Jesus for what he had done for me. Have you, have you got this revelation that he did this for you? Have you, have you got that realization? Has he pulled back the curtain for you to grasp the unbelievably huge thing he did? Then, then Isaiah says this, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. We've each gone astray. And he took it all. He took it all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Like a lamb that's led to slaughter, like a sheep that's silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. Now this is crazy, guys. I just want you to hear how crazy this is. This is 700 years before Jesus hung on the cross. Now let me read to you a passage from Matthew. When Jesus is about to be crucified and he's standing trial before the Roman governor, Pilate, and this is what happens. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Like a lamb being led to slaughter, like a sheep that's silent before its shears, so he did not open his mouth. Jesus just stayed quiet to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53. Are you catching this? Isaiah goes on to say, by oppression 
and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, the people around him, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? In other words, who considered that he was killed for the transgressions of my people to whom the stroke was due? Him for me. Him for me. He came for me and you. Have you got it? Now, the question I have to ask you, you asked it earlier. Did Jesus take our sin and our sicknesses, or did Jesus just take my sin? I think Jesus came to deal with the whole person. In Matthew 8, 16, Matthew sees it this way. Are you ready? When evening came, they brought to him, meaning Jesus, many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word. Isn't that funny? With a word. Like I would say, come out, but that's two words. So what I think he did was say, get Out. Man, that just gives me goosebumps. And he healed some of the people who were ill. Oh, it says it says all. Yeah. And he healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Matthew perceived that Jesus came to deal with the demons in my life, the sickness in my life. You folks, you say, well, Randy, why doesn't everybody get healed? Here's why. I don't know. Well said. I just don't know. I, why doesn't everybody get saved? Why didn't everybody become a follower of Jesus? Why doesn't everybody get over their depression? Why doesn't everybody get over their demons? I, I really, uh, that's one of the first things I'll ask him when I get up there. Lord, can you help me out and understand this? But all I'm saying to you is that he came to set me free, and if I will receive him, he will set me free from my demons, from my illnesses, whatever. You say, what if it doesn't happen? Well, it'll happen when you get up there. Okay? And it's good. I was really bummed when my mom died, and someone said to me, well, she really was healed, and I didn't like hearing that, but it's true. She, my mom was healed. I believed he would heal her on earth, but he didn't. I don't know why. And if you have the answer, I'm betting you don't have the answer. Now, I'd like to show you one final verse in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25. I guess it's not a verse, it's a passage. Here's, here's the hard thing. Are you ready? Here's what Peter says. For you've been called for this purpose. This is what you have been called for. You say, I'm not sure what God called me to do. Peter's telling us right here. You've been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. I don't like this, Randy. Can we move on? Because... I'm called to endure grief and sorrow and misery and, and being rejected. This is a part of the human condition, and I have been called for that purpose. And then it quotes this, who committed no sin. You see all the capitals there? That's a quote from the Old Testament. Who committed no sin, 
nor was any deceit found in his mouth. That's from Isaiah 53, 9, which we're about to get to. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. And while suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. Direct quote from Isaiah 53. Now that passage is dealing directly with the spiritual sickness called sin. For you were continually straying like sheep, quote right from Isaiah 53, 6. But now you've returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Now look at this. Are you ready for this? This is bizarre. His grave was assigned with wicked men. In other words, he was hung on a cross as a regular criminal, and he, he was supposed to be, have one or two things happen to him after he was crucified. Criminals who hung on a cross were either thrown into a junk heap and the dogs and the carrion eaters would come and eat their flesh off of them, or they would be thrown into a common grave. And it was expected that he would be thrown into a common grave. But something happened. Otherwise, this day we would be singing, Up from the ash heap he arose. Up from the junk pile he arose. Up from the common burial place for criminals he arose. But something happened. Don't you love my singing? Would you like more? Yes. Yeah, th that was funny. Did you hear that? No, 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 no. Thank you. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. Now let's go to the New Testament. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it be given to him. So do you know why Jesus was put into a nice, pristine tomb with a rock rolled over it? Because he was with a rich man in his death. So next week, we celebrate the rest of Isaiah 53. Can't wait to go over it with you. Up from the tomb, he arose because he was with a rich man in his death, prophesied 700 years before he came to earth. Man, are you still struggling to believe? Will you just pray with me for a minute? Let's just all bow our heads. Those of you who are struggling believing, would you just maybe just agree with me in this prayer? God, I, I still just have so many doubts and I have so many things that I'm not sure I believe. But Lord, I just ask, Lord, I ask that you'd see my unbelief and that you would somehow break through it. I, I just give you permission to break through my unbelief. I'm struggling to believe it. And I, I'm, I'm even kind of snickering as I'm praying this prayer because I'm not even sure I believe in you. But if you are there, Will you show me how you took my sin? Will you show me how you took my rejection? How you took my insecurity? Took my fears? You took my bitterness? 
You took my demons. You took my, Lord, you took my addictions. And I receive your love and your sacrifice for me today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.